I would like to open with a quote from Microsoft President Brad Smith's new book. And here's what he says. When your technology changes the world, you bear a responsibility to help address the world you have helped create. That's a powerful statement. It goes beyond just taking responsibility for what happens on your platforms, say driver harassment in an Uber or hate speech on YouTube. Here's the question to you both. Do you agree that tech companies have a bigger responsibility? Absolutely agree. So our view is that we have an absolute obligation to our users to be not just helpful but responsible. And we're fundamentally tech optimists. Our view is that technology throughout history, if you look at it, has been a force for good. And when we look at the products and services we provide, it's in things like information, knowledge, increasingly in health detection. But throughout history, there's also been a negative unintended consequence. And it's our role to make sure we're focused on that and ahead of it. I think one of the most articulate answers on this or comments was President Kennedy. He said that science has no conscience of its own. It's what we do with it. And so for us, it's about raising the bar on ourselves, whether it's on privacy or security or, to your point, content, and then leaning in and working with regulators and civil society on smart regulation where that may make sense. Dara, how do you think about it? I, I very much agree with what Ruth was saying. We, we absolutely have a responsibility. And what's interesting for Uber is that um, we not only operate in the digital sphere, but we very much are rooted in the physical, right? You push a button and a car shows up and every day there's seven, 17 million interactions that happen between a driver and a rider. And uh, I think that the early ethos within technology, because these are young people who, who didn't necessarily think about consequences of what they were building, they were builders, is, listen, we're connecting people and people will be people, right? But technology increasingly creates people with superpowers. These can be digital superpowers. These are uh, people on Twitter who have huge followings, et cetera. Or physically, when you're making that many connections, it's not good enough to say, well, people are going to be people. We actually then have to take responsibility. And for us, the responsibility that we look at, our version of content is actually safety. So how do we make sure that every interaction that happens in a car between a courier and uh, after delivery is safe? And just as Ruth and team have put a bunch of safeguards as it relates to content, we have put a number of safeguards, uh, 911 button, uh, using our data essentially to help make our content safer, which in some ways is making the physical world safer. I'm going to challenge you. Sure. I suspect that what you just said is exactly what people in this room wanted to hear. It's what people watching around the world wanted to hear. But it's challenging. How do you define this broader responsibility for negative externalities? Because the oil industry doesn't feel a responsibility to decarbonize the atmosphere. And the consumer packaged goods industry doesn't feel a responsibility to clean up all the plastic in the oceans, where do you draw the line and how do you manage it? Well, let me take you through how we do it with YouTube. So YouTube, two billion users around the globe, beloved in many different ways. And yet, clearly, we have been dealing with issues of extreme content and how do we manage it. And just to say we want to keep it safe isn't enough. We have to be investing in the right way to protect users and communities. And for us, there are three parts to it. One. It's manual reviewers. We have 10,000 reviewers across Google. Number two, it's the use of machine learning, because the speed with which we can look at content, analyze it, and then pull it down is obviously meaningfully enhanced with machine learning. In fact, through machine learning, 80% uh, of the videos that were taken down were never even viewed. But then very importantly, we've teamed up with NGOs, because increasingly, when you're talking about extreme content, it's not as direct as you would hope. It's, a, it's, a, it's subtext, it's a dog whistle. And so we need experts in areas, every one of these areas of extreme content to help us decipher what is this dog whistle. We're now working with 150 NGOs who are helping us within each vertical. And their insights, their translation then gets to reinforce what are we doing through our manual reviewers and what are we doing through machine learning. 
But fundamentally, it's these investments that we need to make. And when I say we keep upping the bar on ourselves, it doesn't stop there. One of the next concerns is this whole area of deep fakes. Take a video. What are you going to be saying on a video with a deep fake? So we need to make sure that we're staying ahead of where things go, not just trying to catch up with it. Easier to prevent uh, than to fix. And so, for example, yesterday, we just published work that we've been doing with academics and one of our sister organizations, Jigsaw, about some of the issues around deep fakes in a hope that we can better educate all of those of us who are trying to build these guardrails. And it's really those investments that are critical if we hope to deliver on the objective which we do. Dara, how do you define the responsibility and how do you make it practical? So I think uh, you, you've, you've really identified a long-term problem as to where the responsibility lies and, and where the big picture is going five years from now. But sometimes the big picture five years from now gets in the way of improvement tomorrow. All right, I think that there's a dialogue that's going on. We're talking about it, we haven't figured it out. We, you know, I, I think society is trying to figure out ultimately where the ultimate responsibility lies. And we are going to be a part of that dialogue, but I don't want that dialogue to get in the way of getting better tomorrow and then the day after and the day after. So we're taking a very practical look at this. Uh, one, how do we put the tools in front of the rider and driver so that if something happens, you get instant reaction. We're integrating our data with 911 so that, again, the response time if something uh, bad happens is, is immediate. Uh, we have tools in place, for example, tr to track your loved ones. My daughter, when she takes an Uber ride, I know where she's starting, where she's ending, et cetera, so that I'm aware of what's going on. And for example, now we're using uh, machine learning tools with a new feature called Ride Check. We know where you started, we know where you're ending, and if the trip is supposed to take 15 minutes and there's a sudden stop and the trip hasn't ended where it's supposed to end, we will actually go out and contact the driver and the rider just to make sure some, uh, everything's okay. So we're, you know, where the ultimate responsibility lies, I think that's a, that's a dialogue and an ultimate answer that society has to provide us. But in the meantime, I think all of us are iterating and improving on a daily basis so that our content, the environment in which we operate is safer than it was yesterday. I'm, I'd go say ahead. there's one other point, which is that increasingly there are opportunities not to just do this alone, but as an example, there's something that we helped establish called the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. And this is a cross-tech group. It's with governments. It's with NGOs. And the view is that when you're looking at terrorism and extreme content, if each of us just try and solve this by focusing on what we see, we're missing the opportunity to connect the dots across the globe. Whereas if we come together as a group and we share whatever data we have, we're better able collectively to see early, early steps in the development of either a terrorist group or extremism. And one of the goals for the group set early in the year was to have 200,000 digital footprints, fingerprints of, of uh, terrorist content. We achieved that goal. And so now the question is where to next? But it is the notion of, again, collaborative across tech, across hmm. government and civil society that enables us to move the ball forward in some of these areas. I want you, Dara, to evaluate the approach Ruth just described against what we've heard <laughs> from Facebook. And what I mean by this is, what, Ruth, you've just said we're using tools that we've developed, we're using collaboration with NGOs and governments around the world to come up with a set of best practices and standards that we think we can defend. Am I being fair? Where it's a journey, and yes, that's, that's certainly the aim. So, and as I recall it, and as I've read it, and seen him talk about it, Mark Zuckerberg has effectively sort of thrown his hands up in the air a little bit and says, we're not sure that we trust ourselves to do these things. Government, please regulate us. Tell us what is right and wrong. What do you think? I think that um, you're being a little unfair. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think agree. that when, <laughs> when he talks about government, please regulate us, the, the expectation is, is that there's a dialogue about where proper regulation lies. Listen, we on Uber, we, we're regulated on a local basis, city by city, country by country, uh, and short term, the, the ability for regulation to 
react to market changes short term is quite limited, but long term regulation tends to go in the right direction. And I don't think that Mark Zuckerberg or Google or any of us are saying, just tell us what to do, right? We want to enter a dialogue. Uh, it is our responsibility to be more transparent than we have been in the past. I think if there's one thing that we say guilty is charged, technology companies have not been as transparent five years you know, going back as we have to be five years going forward. And these are trade secrets, et cetera. These are, these are competitive industries. And we came from a certain place. And, and you know, I don't want to kind of, uh, kind of qualify why we were there. We have to make sure that going forward, their approach is different. And I do think that going forward, the approach of Google, Facebook, et cetera, is we're going to be transparent. We want to have a dialogue. And we're not going to make the rules. And I think that's Mark's point, which is it's not for us to make the rules. It's for governments to make the rules. And we want to be a part of that process. I think the tricky element, and I more agree with Dara than the question, um, the, the tricky, <laughs> Guilty the tricky element. Th thanks for the chance to dump on Facebook, though. <laughs> I really appreciate it. The tricky <laughs> element of this for all of us is that choices aren't as stark often as it, one might think. So what do I mean by that? We're putting two values are coming into conflict with one another. So we, uh, for those of us who, here who uphold freedom of speech, what, does, what do you do? When does that come into conflict with something that's going to encroach on safety? And so our approach has been to establish community guidelines, and we're constantly challenged as to whether we drew the line in the right place. And the reason we work with experts in these verticals is to help us draw where that line should be. So to have government step in and say, yes, freedom of speech is sacrosanct, but here's where you need to draw the line, adds an element of simplicity, but it is also fraught. And that's the balancing act that I think we and they are trying to um, address. Well, tell us what it's like in your experience. Is it possible in this current environment to have a productive conversation with lawmakers and regulators because the public just sees 50 states banding together, more or less asking for your company to be broken up. And, and, and they wonder, what's going on behind the scenes? So there are plenty of areas where we're currently already regulated or leaning into regulation. And I'll give you a couple of examples. At Google, privacy is sacrosanct. It has been from the earliest day. Our view is that it is your data. And so early on, we invested in things like privacy controls so that it's easy for you to find your data and your controls. 20 million people go to our privacy controls every day. And we keep trying to improve 20 them. 20 million. 20 million people go every day. And the question for all of us is, is the, do you, you know, what, do you, what kind of relationship do you want to have? If you were trying to get here today, trying to figure out the easiest way to get here, the fastest way to get here, and you Google, you know, how do I get to the plaza quickly? It is helpful to have that anchor in your location. That is a choice you're going to make. Or if you're coming to New York for this event, when you're coming, you're going to get fed with what events are going on, the weather, is your flight on time? That's a choice that you make. So users should have the opportunity to have a choice. And it is our obligation to make sure their data is protected. They know it's theirs. If they want to leave, they leave with it. So we've done a lot of work about on, on privacy and data. How does that relate to your question? There is still a yearning for more. And so what we are doing very clearly is working with Congress. We're clear that we support national privacy legislation. As always, the devil's in the details. And therefore, I think it's incumbent on each of us to lean in and provide insight into the areas where there would be unintended consequences from regulation. So privacy is one example. Another one is uh, the question is often asked of tech, are you paying your fair share in tax? The reality is we're, we've paid at the OECD average for the last decade, but that narrative still exists. And one of the key issues is that the international tax structure is outdated. Now, the OECD has come forth with a proposal which is gathering more support for a fundamental redo of the international tax system. We very clearly support that. And again, devil's in the details. How do you work through it? But it does feel like it is progressing. So if you, if you want to be a constructive part of the solution, you have an obligation to bring whatever insights and technical expertise you have so that we end up with smart regulation. I, I do think that one of the dangers of, of the regulatory regime and the directions that we're going in right now, I, I, I very much agree with, with Ruth's direction, is that regulation and innovation are not friends. 
Uh, and listen, we're big companies, and, and we will have the dialogue and abide by the regulation on a, on a global basis, and when the rules are clear, we're going to follow those rules, absolutely. But I do think that the startups of the world, these, the businesses that are building the, the exciting new ideas, et cetera, whatever regulation there is, we would want there to be room for innovation at a certain level, at the much lower scale, so that you can have startups who have some sandbox to innovate in, uh, to take some risks in, at a size in which they're not kind of a fundamental change or one way or the other of society, and then once they get to a certain size, they've got to regulate, they've got to buy just like everyone else. So the, the direction, the dialogue, I think is a positive dialogue. The large global companies are going to do what we should, and we're going to do the right thing, but to create a sandbox for innovation that, you know, 10 years ago created Uber and 20 years ago created uh, Google for that innovation still to be possible within a regulatory framework I think is incredibly Does important. either of you think that sandbox is getting too small? I think um, some of the, the rule making uh, is, creates, is problematic for startups. It's, it's tougher for them. They have to think about five different things versus just going and building a great product that is uh, that consumers love, et cetera. So I, Anything I you'd point to specifically? Uh, when, when you look in Europe and some of the, uh, some of the regulations there, uh, there's a European startup tech scene out there, and you know, they have one more thing to worry about. Now, ultimately, I think it's a good thing, and this is a necessary ingredient, but as we look forward, I do think we should look to, to create a sandbox for the smaller players. Do you see places where regulation is stifling innovation, Ruth? I think there's the risk of it. One of the most extraordinary opportunities for all of us today is the application of AI machine learning to our businesses. Uh, it's already in so many of the elements of our life we take for granted, like voice search or image search and translate. Um, it can be helpful in so many areas, like d disease detection. It's an extraordinary asset for us. Uh, for us as a country, for us as a society. Mm -hmm. And so one of the key questions is how do we ensure, in particular in this area, where there's such potential on the upside and potentially on the downside, that we're managing it properly? Our approach, very similar to what has been done throughout history when there have been big science breakthroughs, is to try and put out a set of principles and ask others to build on it. And that was done with IVF and stem cell work and PCB. So this notion of industry standards and build we think is a constructive and nimble way to continue to make advancements. One of the questions is where does this go? And I think the risk in particular for the US is how are we going to ensure that we're continuing to support innovation and not therefore really slow down what we're able to do relative to others. I'm glad you brought it up. So how do the companies that are at the forefront of artificial intelligence, that are at the forefront of autonomous vehicles think about this looming problem, let's call it, or potential problem of human redundancy. That's what everybody's worried about. How do you think about that? Well, I think that the, uh, from my viewpoint, listen, the, the press drama is of machines replacing humans. Uh, I actually think the reality, more so, is machines augmenting humans, right? The humans are one thing, machines are a different thing, humans and machines are the best thing. And we do see machine learning uh, starting to replace simple, repetitive, predictable tasks. Uh, and we think that as we're able to use machine learning for those tasks, we can use humans for more complex tasks, unpredictable events, et cetera. When we look at autonomous driving, our autonomous team is looking to solve the one to 5% simplest routes out there where you know, the human ingenuity really isn't rewarded. And that machine learning can actually lower costs, can make available our transportation uh, uh, solutions for more people. And as we lower costs, the market grows. As the market grows, we have more drivers. So from our standpoint, when you look at our business 10 years from now, uh, we will absolutely have more drivers on the platform than we do today. Uh, and machines will be uh, operating, we'll be taking the 20% simplest routes. Uh, and so that right now, I think the hybrid of, of, of machines and humans together for the next 10 to 15 years is where the world is heading and ultimately we think that it will create more room 
uh, for people to use their ingenuity versus machines doing the simple stuff. Did you want to add something? Well, I would agree. I think if I can just point everyone back to when the ATM machines were introduced <laughs> and there was a concern that we would no longer have banks, and of course banks have continued to grow. This has been anxiety. It's much easier to see the things that may be going away than to envision the new jobs that will come out of this. And so I very much agree with Dara that new opportunities come. And we similarly look at AI as leveraging humanity, whether you call it augmented intelligence or leveraging humanity, it enables it enables us each to do focus on tasks in a, a more meaningful way. So, so that makes me wonder, because and and the the connection you establish with the ATM is actually relevant for the question that I have in mind. There's angst, as you point out, mm -hmm. Dara, whether it's manufactured by the press or not. There's angst about human redundancy, job losses, job reductions. Um, there's angst about privacy, there's angst about the integrity of the electoral system, there's angst about fraud and ID theft. These are all byproducts of the digital age. Wall Street paid the price for underestimating you know, the degree of upset and outrage some of its business practices caused in the lead up to the financial crisis and its aftermath. Did Silicon Valley fail to heed those lessons? I think the lessons, having lived through that period in financial services, what's been intriguing to me is how relevant they actually are for all industries. Mm. And there, the elements of the what were the lessons from that period, uh, I, I actually summarize somewhat differently. I think that the collapse, of course, triggered justifiable anger given the pain that so many individuals and businesses went through. But the lessons from the crisis, I would say the first and most important is identify your source of vulnerability and protect against it early. For banks, it was liquidity, and without it, you choked. And by the time banks or the financial system realized they had to focus on liquidity, it was too late. In technology, a lot of the issues that we've been talking about, which is focus on investing in long-term growth that creates value and focus on mitigating the potential downside, is where we are focused. And so I, understandable that there's concern, and I think Dara is spot on when he says that shame on us for not doing more on transparency and da data and, and communication so people understand what's the value trade-off, what are they getting, what choices do they want. Go back to my comment about uh, privacy, but I think there's some fundamentally different um, observations from that period. Dara, your company just went through the debate surrounding the California statute mm -hmm. that wants to reclassify for hire drivers as employees. Um, how, you know, based on that experience and others that you've been in, how toxic would you say the political environment for the tech industry is right now? I, I think it's a, it's a difficult environment. Um, and we're right in the middle of it. So for me to define toxicity or not uh, is, is hard because I don't have an objective view. You know, but when I look at AB5, um, I do think that there, you know, society has been looking at kind of having a job, a respectable job, as equivalent of having a full-time job. And I think that, that era of kind of your job being about your company is, is over, right? I think the new era is, is about work, and the work that you do as an individual, and eventually, you know, I think I'd like to go to an era where a programmer can work for a great project on Google and then jump on and work for a great project for us, et cetera. This marriage of the work that you do as being a marriage also to a company, there are some people who may choose that, but I actually think the much more important marriage and, sat and satisfaction is about the work that you do. And I do think that we are moving uh, in society to a new transition, which is the expectation is regardless of what you do, regardless of whether or not you want to attach yourself to a company or uh, full-time work or part-time work or full-time work doing a bunch of stuff, um, there is an expectation of protections. Uh, there's an expectation of minimum earnings. There's an expectation of, of health care, et cetera. Uh, that expectation is already in place in Europe. Uh, and we think that the right way forward is not to classify everyone as full-time, um, to create what is hopefully, we view, the best of both worlds. You can be full-time if you want to. You want to 
work at a company for the next 10 years, uh, go ahead, Uber's a great one. Uh, but if you don't want to get married to a company and you want to have flexibility of time, et cetera, there is a new classification that gives you the protections that you want. That's the dialogue that we're having. We're having it too late. Uh, and that is part of the issue of just moving too fast. Uh, but we think we're hoping that that dialogue can get to a better answer than AB5. I'm going to tie together two seemingly unrelated events of the past few weeks. We started philosophically and perhaps we'll end philosophically. And I hope you catch my drift here. So the first event is the business round table. Effectively, a lobby group, a trade organization for America's largest companies embracing this notion of stakeholders, either in addition to or over exclusively shareholders. And the second, and this is where I'm hoping you stay with me, is the WeWork IPO debacle. And my question for you is, do they together, and with other things that we see happening, herald a new era of corporate governance? So I would say when we look at the, um, the business roundtable um, commentary, much of it actually, I would say, goes back to the Google IPO statement, which is we're investing for the long term. We want to make sure we're investing in the right way to create value for the long term. And to do that, we actually invest in our employees because talent is the magnet that will drive long-term value creation. Um, we invest in the communities in which we operate. You asked about this transition to, the new, to a new economy, a digital economy. One of the things we're really proud of is the work we do in digital skills training around the globe. We want to make sure we're present in the communities in which we operate. We think about things like sustainability. Like we've been carbon neutral since 07. We match 100% of our energy consumption with renewables. We keep going on that front. So our view is to be the magnet for talent, which enables us to create the magic that ends up being the best product for users and businesses, is actually a virtuous circle. And so um, it, it, it is in many respects a false dichotomy. If the reason we don't provide earnings guidance and haven't, and I, when I was a banker at Morgan Stanley, I similarly advised clients don't do earnings guidance, is I think that it puts you in a trap of not making the right decisions for one of your many constituents because you're either solving for a quarter or you're missing something you should invest in so that you don't miss the quarter. And so all of this, if you lens back and you go to Larry Fink's letters about invest for the long term, Guidance can be a trap. Make sure you're doing, you're comporting yourself in the highest quality way. These are all mutually reinforcing. And I do think governance is one of the really critical elements. We have to make sure in every element that we are actually focused on what creates long-term value. Growth for growth's sake does not work. It never has, it never will. And if you go back to my point, which is greatest source of vulnerability, well, one of them is growth for growth's sake. That is a horrible long-term plan. And if you actually put in place the right structure and governance, I think that all of this ties and it, and it is consistent. We've Bruce, just if you, seen... If you want to talk to our employees, you have an invite anytime, so I appreciate it. We've just seen a good example of that growth for growth's sake not working. I referenced it a moment ago. Uh, Dara, what would, you, what would you add to what Ruth said? I, I think Ruth, Ruth put it together perfectly. I, I think, so the only thing that I'd add is we're in the era of transparency, right? Your external and internal truths have to come together. Uh, and I think what you are seeing now is um, this transition for some companies that have been private, that have been, um, that, that have not had to show everything. You know, here's who I am, et cetera. When they got, get under the harsh spotlight of full transparency, tell me exactly what you are and what the truth is and who you are both inside and outside. Um, then there are some who make that transition and some who don't, right? We, at, uh, with Uber, we went through the governance transformations, et cetera, as we came public. Um, it wasn't because, like, we were really smart or, or you know, uh, uh, forward thinking. It was because we thought we had to. We had to prepare for the bright lights, and we, we'd already experienced the bright lights, and sometimes they really make you sweat. Uh, but ultimately, I do think that this transparency um, it goes to the, the beginning of the conversation. This is a different world. Um, the, the, the light that is shining upon us is sometimes uncomfortable, 
but I think long term, it'll make for a better society, it'll make for better companies, and ultimately it'll be, it'll be, it'll create a better environment for investment as well. Well, Dar Ruth, thank you for joining me under the bright lights thank here you. at the GBF. Great today. to be with you. Thank